السلام عليكم جميعا ارحب بكم بالويبنار اليوم اللي راح نخصصه على يا الشاب فلويد واندلاع المظاهرات الشديدة في كل مكان في الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية ونحاول تسليط الضوء صار لغط كثير خاصة بيناتنا إحنا كمثقفين عراقيين عن هذه الأسباب والتداعيات وما إليه وشنو تأثيرها على السياسة الأمريكية وأين ذاهبة أمريكا وكثير من النظريات التي قيلت حول الموضوع اليوم ويانا اثنين من الأساتذة المهتمين في هذا المجال والمتخصصين فيه وسيحاولون إلقاء الضوء أحدهم من زاوية علم الاجتماع والآخر من زاوية علم الاجتماع السياسي وعلاقة الموضوع بالسياسة بس قبل لا أبتدي أنا أود أن أنوه أنه إحنا نظراً للنجاح اللي حاصل في هذه الندوات التي نعقدها قررنا أن نحول الموضوع إلى شكل أكثر تأسيسي وهو نطلق ما نسميه ديوانية المستقلة أو ديوانية المجموعة المستقلة للأبحاث التي ستكون مخصصة أو ستكون منبر فكري لمناقشة مختلف القضايا الثقافية والفكرية في العراق وفي الوطن العربي وفي العالم ورح ما تقتصر فقط على السياسة وإنما تتناول الثقافة بمختلف مجالاتها ومختلف شؤونها سياسة، اجتماع، فن، أدب، رياضة كل المجالات وسنستضيف في كل أسبوع إن شاء الله مختصين في هذا المجال من خلال نفس الطريقة هذه وتتم المناقشة رح نعلم من يريد الانضمام لها لهذا وهناك الآن هيئة تأسيسية تعمل أو ستعمل على هذا الموضوع إن شاء الله ونعلمكم لاحقا بالتطورات اليوم خلينا نرجع على موضوعنا اللي هو موضوع التطورات الحاصلة في المجتمع الأمريكي رح ابتداء يعني علينا أن أو مسألة تجذب الانتباه وهي أنه هذه ليس لم تكن الحادثة الأولى التي يتم فيها اغتيال شاب أسود أو من أصول أفريقية أمريكي على يد الشرطة الأمريكية أكو سجل طويل في هذا المجال لكن ما السبب الذي جعل هذه المرة التظاهرات تندلع بهذا الشكل وتكتسب هذا الزخم الكبير وتنتشر ليس في داخل الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية فقط وإنما إلى خارج الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية وحدثنا نشهد اليوم ظاهرة جديدة في رفض العنصرية فتطور الموضوع وطبعا هناك نظريات ان امريكا ستسقط او النظام السياسي الامريكي سيسقط وهناك طبعا شفنا سمعنا وقرينا كثير من النظريات حول هذا الموضوع افضل من sorry. sorry to cut in just uh, for everyone there is translation available so from the world sign just please choose english everyone can hear it اوكي كول ثانكس مرحبا جميعا بس اكو ترجمه عربيه للي حاب من العلامه اسفل الشاشه تقدر تختار البرتغاليه للعربي او انجليزي للانجليزي انا اسف ما نبهت ما نبهت على هذا الموضوع 
الاول المتحدثين عندنا هي البروفيسور والدكتوره شي وهي باحثه متخصصه في علم الاجتماع وبالذات تهتم بالاقليات وهي الان مديره برنامج ما بعد الدكتوراه في جامعه ميشيغان والدكتوره شي واحده من المعروفين في هذا المجال في الولايات المتحده الامريكيه بمناقشتها وكتبت عن هذا يعني عن هذه الظاهره الكثير وانا ممنون جدا وشاكر لها تشريفها لنا وتخصيصها لوقتها الثمين لعرض هذه هذا الموضوع المهم على النخبه العراقيه وعلى المثقفين العراقيين. Thank you Shay for being with us now uh, and uh, I would start with asking a question about why all that momentum for protest right now. It has not been the first ever time in U.S. history that African-American young guy killed uh, by uh, whether the police or, or others. Uh, you have a long history of racism. Uh, so why uh, I have to, to go to English? Just a couple of make it to me. Uh, so yeah, yeah I, I heard him. Yes, I hear him. Okay. I hear you. Right. So uh, it, now uh, it, it looks very strange. Why uh, this momentum and why all these uh, protest, violence, etc. Can you give us a, a brief uh, idea about what's going on right now, please? Absolutely. I want to thank you so much for inviting me to speak um, in this wonderful forum, and I am honored to be invited. My research looks at you know, under what conditions do we see these protests, these uprisings following police killings and police violence? So this is exactly what I, I research. And what I have found is that this, these protests have been going on for years. Um, we can actually trace some of the earliest known protests back 100 years ago to 1917 and possibly even before. This most recent wave, though, actually did not start with George Floyd. This most recent wave, I believe, really started in 2014 when Michael Brown, who was a young black teenager who lived in Ferguson, Missouri, when he was killed by a police officer there while he was unarmed. So in that town, mass protests erupted um, there were there was some of the the kind of property damage that we see now. So there were a few some fires set. There was property damage, but this was for the most part very very peaceful protest with a little bit of the fringes of some property violence. But that incident sparked hundreds of protests around the country since then, since 2014. And in my research, so during, I look at the years of 2015 and 2016, and almost a, over 1,100 people were killed by police in the United States during that time, which is about three, almost three times more than Canada and about almost 100 times more than the UK, given the share, the United, the United Kingdom, given the share of the, the population. But of those who are African American, they're killed by police at a rate that is about two and a half times that of white Americans, given their share of the population. However, 
their deaths lead to protest at a much, much higher rate. So what I found is that over a third of those black, black Americans who were killed by police, over a third of their deaths have led to some form of local protest. And it is that local protest and in all of these different cities and towns where these deaths happen that has really laid the groundwork for the mass mobilization that we are seeing right now. So over the number of years, the organizers and activists in these cities and towns have begun to call for police accountability and they've begun to work on issues that even expand outside the police related to poverty and health and education in order to, to further what they term as the movement for Black lives. So this is actually not the first time that we've seen nationwide protest or even international protest related to Black Lives Matter. So in 2016, during the summer, there were, there were three Black men who were killed by police very close together, or there were similarly videos that went viral on the internet depicting their deaths. And the protests spread again throughout the country and we also saw protests related to this case in, you know, in London, in Berlin, um, in Ireland, and other places as well. But at the time there was a lot going on in the news. There was the 2016 presidential election and there was everything else that typically happens in a normal everyday life that people were pay, kind of distracted, didn't give it the sole focus of attention. But something that I think is unique in this moment is again, not the fact that a black man was killed by police, because you are right, that happens very frequently in the United States. And also not that there were protests, because as I mentioned, that also happens quite frequently. But I think there's a unique moment in part because of the pandemic where both the activists and the organizers were very strong because they had come in to fill many of the gaps that were left by our weakened um, institutions. So people are, some people are without food or some people are struggling to pay rent. People in the prisons are dying at a disproportionate rate from COVID-19. And so these organizers that have been dealing with policing issues and other issues were really engaged in their communities and very activated. At the same time, people are, pay, there's, there was very little other news going on in the world, or at least in the United States, other than what was going on in the pandemic. And people were, so when this came out, people were very aware, very attuned, and they also had more, honestly, more free time to protest. So people who were out of a job or who were out of school or who had the flexibility to work from home or take some time in the afternoon to go to a protest, they were able to do so in a way that they weren't in the past. And I think that, the, that while these protests started out very organized, um, where you know, these activists that have been doing this work for years were the ones who started, you know, really started the call for people to come and gather there was a narrative in the news that these were very spontaneous, which actually served to make them even bigger because people in small towns where they've never protested before or teenagers who have no experience organizing the protest felt that they could also do so as well. So they actually were inspired to get on Facebook and create events in, again, in places that, that, that they never saw these events, these protests before. And so that actually fueled the spread even more, I believe. So I hope that um, answers the part of the question of how we got to this point and what is happening right now. So if, if I uh, want to uh, just compare between the situation right now and the situation on 1960s, where we had almost, it's not similar, but an incident which made the explosion. Mm -hmm. That lady in the bus, the, the, the African-American lady in the bus who refused to give her seat to, to a white, and that was the incident which, so do you see any, any similarities in the 
uh, in the atmosphere and do you think that this will lead to a similar movement that happened on 1960s after that by uh, Dr. King and uh, which leaded later on to a lot of reform in yeah. the U.S. Uh, system. Do you think that will happen also now? So I think there are a few things that are similar and different. So something that is similar is that a lot of the, the issues, the core issues that led to the civil rights movement, we are still seeing today. So then police brutality, even though, you know, we look back at that movement and focus a lot on desegregation and voting rights, which were crucial parts of the movement. One of the biggest drivers of protest in a lot of these incidents was actually police brutality. So in that sense, there's a lot of similarities. But I do think that this movement is new in a lot of ways, both in terms of its age and in terms of the way that organizers and the way that activists are approaching it. So you mentioned Rosa Parks, the African-American woman who refused to give up her seat on the bus. When she made, when she made that decision, it was actually part of a, it was a, it was a deliberate effort actually on, um, that was, no, she was a, already an organizer. She was already an activist. And this movement had already been going on for several years. And the activists were trying to figure out different ways to advance their cause. And so this was actually part of, in a way, part of that. Um, by the time we were in the 1960s, when Martin Luther King was very prominent in the news, the activism that had been taking that had been building the groundwork had already been happening throughout the 1950s. So we had a, you know, a whole decade ahead of time of laying the groundwork for that movement. Right now, we're interesting, it's interesting because we've had about six years of this movement so far. And it is now fin kind of finally coming really much to the surface. Something that I think, there are a few things that I think are different though. Um, one is that things, and this has been in some ways a critique of the movement in the United States, but it is very, um, it's not hierarchical. There are no, there's no top leadership. Um, in part, <laughs> this is because if there is no one at the top, there is no one to assassinate and kill the movement. But another real practical reason for this is the issue of policing is very, very decentralized. So there are over 18,000 police law enforcement policing agencies in the United States. And they are almost all controlled at the local or the county or the state level. And so in a way, there's, there's less that the federal government has the capacity to do to make change. There's also a big difference here in terms of trust and belief that and beliefs that the federal government would create change. So in the 1960s, um, almost 80% of the U.S. population, at least that was polled at that time, believed had faith. Reported that they had faith that the federal government would do what is right. Currently, that faith is only at around 17%. Mm -hmm. And so there is no. I think among these organizers, there's almost no faith that the federal government, especially with um, our current president, that they would do the right thing when it comes to changing the police or in terms of ending racism or dealing with institutional structures that perpetuate racism. And so in some ways, I think this movement is quite different because every, most things are happening at a very local level. Okay, and you just mentioned the president, and this was, will be my, my next question, but in a different way. Because for us, those who live across the Atlantic, when on 2010, uh, a new African-American president had been elected, Mr. Obama. Yes. We thought that United States had just started a new 
era. After 10 years, mm -hmm. after 10 years, we see that we might uh, be wrong in our evaluation to the system in United States, to the racism in United States, and you still have these uh, uh, deeply rooted racism. Mm -hmm. Do you think that what happened now is a black uh, or going back to the um, old uh, decades or it's just one incident and there is nothing uh, need to be worried about it. Yes. So I think that most people also in the United States also thought in 2010 and 2008 when Obama was elected that we were past racism. We were past racism. Racism had ended. We were in a what they called a post-racial society where those issues of the past were no longer relevant. Um, that was purely perception that the, the, live, the lived experience, though, of Black Americans had not changed. Um, the economic situation had not improved since the 1970s. The police violence had certainly not improved. What I think was, what was happening more was that the voices and the stories that people were paying attention to just did, were, they were not looking at those issues. I think that something that has changed is not that is not the racism that has stayed quite constant, constant, but is it actually the uncovering of it? So I think that there that is a factor that social media has played a big role in, and also through technologies like camera phones, so that people can take video of these incidents and share them in a way that is undeniable what is happening in a way that you know even if the, the national news chose would, would not be sending a reporter to some city or town to look, to look do an in-depth investigation into what's going on. The citizens themselves can now be that voice, the, the, the camera men themselves taking those photos or videos. Um, there is some evidence though that, this is I think what, something that has really come to the surface from these protests and this incident with George Floyd is that there's often a belief in the United States that racism is only your own personal feelings, your own personal hatred. But something that activists and many black people have been trying to draw attention to for decades now, which I think is now starting to be heard, is that racism doesn't have to be individual. It can be at, at the level of institutions and societal structures that perpetuate. So a judge or a police officer may not personally hate black people, but if they are asked to work or asked to do things in a certain way that make it more likely that they will incarcerate or injure or threaten the lives of black people, if, even if it is the orders that are coming from you know, their superiors or it's the demands of you know voters that that itself can be that, that that itself is racism is not necessarily just personal beliefs but also the institutions okay i have two questions for you the, i will keep the last one because it is uh, I will play the the, the role of uh, devil advocate, but right now I want to ask you about what do you think the role of the presidency, your presidency, in what's going on right now? It, uh, do you think that uh, it really matter that Mr. Trump in the White House right now? Yes and no. So in some ways, I think that th these protests would absolutely be occurring and they would actually absolutely be big regardless of whether Trump was the president. Something though that I think is a factor is that 
these protests are more multiracial, multi-ethnic than they have been in the past. So there are even more white Americans that are joining the protest than ever before. And many of them, I, I, I'm forgetting the study, but there's a, a colleague actually here at the University of Michigan report, interviewed some of them about why they joined the protest. And many of these white Americans reported that they were, it was a way to also protest against the president. So because Trump expressed so much um, contempt and so much anger towards the protesters, this motivated them to join even more. And especially when he threatened to send the military, that very much angered people who maybe would not have joined otherwise who decided to join. So in some ways it's made the protests bigger, but I'm not sure it's be with, the protests would still absolutely be occurring, I think, if it were not for him. So, so do you think that your government has handled the, these or managed these protests in a proper way? No, <laughs> I do not, um, not at all. I think that, again, what's interesting here though is the, the power of the local governments and the local police because they're in most cases the ones who are deciding whether or not to tear gas protesters, whether or not to set curfews, whether or not to wear riot gear to many demonstrations that are perfectly peaceful. So, and I've, you know, I've witnessed some of these protests both now and in the past and, you know, what the police even wear to these protests will really often determine how the protesters respond. Because if it's a demonstration where there are you know, peaceful people singing and their children and their grandparents, but the police show arrive with armored vehicles and rubber bullets, this sends a very, very bad message and people are very angered by it. So I think that there seems to be some learning that is happening. So some states are banning the use of tear gas or some departments are suspending that. Um, so the only, the only protests that I think that Trump has more direct control, more direct control over are those in Washington, DC, which very, we've seen that they, you know, tear gassed protesters and violently removed them for him to take a photo with the Bible. Um, so I don't think that they are handling them well, but I do think that there's learning happening in that potentially some of the abuses may be decreasing, although we, we will see this weekend what happens. Okay. May I ask how many protesters have been killed or injured by the police? Um, so there have, that's a good question. Injured, we don't know. There's hmm. a lot that have been injured. There have been over, we know that there have been at least over 10,000 arrested. There have been, I believe, six people killed, close to six or seven people killed, but not always by police. Some of them have also been by um, un, un, either unknown gunmen in the crowd, or some of them are also from more right-wing vigilantes that have showed up and have um, you know, shot at protesters. So some of those, the, the protesters didn't actually die, um, they, but they were injured by gunfire. So that's actually a, a good question that I don't have the, a perfect answer for, but there have been a lot of injuries, absolutely. And just, just for your knowledge, in Iraq, we have been uh, in protest since 2019, uh, October 2019, mm -hmm. till now. Yes. Young Iraqis are protesting. Till now, uh, we have almost 700 killed, wow. more than 25,000 injured and most of these the government claim that it's by unknown person and they call it the third party there is yes. a third so maybe you have also a third party as well <laughs> that has ha that has actually happened there was a situation where 
um, I forget which state, I think in Kentucky, where they, they claimed that it was a third party, but then it was later revealed that it was an undercover officer. So we have invented that, uh, yeah. that term in Iraq. It's our invention, the third party. Anyway, <laughs> the, last, the last question. Uh, I am one of those who follow up the U.S. news mm -hmm. uh, or the media uh, channels and especially CNN and Fox News. Yeah. And you know the differences between both, yeah. both outlets. In Fox News, I have frequently heard some commentators and uh, journalists, political analysts, who claim that uh, US or uh, African-American young uh, they have the highest rate of criminology, they have the highest rate of theft, killing, blah, 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 all these things, which can justify mm -hmm. the behavior of the police. Police always feel hostile towards black Americans because they feel that they are dangerous, they feel that they might kill them, and they uh, always present some statistics about this. Yeah. What do you think about that? Yes, yeah, so this is the, there's been a, a almost deliberate campaign to portray black Americans as violent and criminal since before the Civil War. So even from slavery times, there was this idea of the the black brute, they called it a like brute threat. So the idea that they weren't even, they were animalistic and violent. So this is what, kind of a continuation of that. There is, however, some issue, there is in some ways some truth though to the, the higher levels of violence in the black community. So African-Americans are far and away more likely to be the victims of murder. So, this is actually something that the that current activists who are calling for, so you may have heard that many activists are calling for the police to be defunded. So what they're asking for is for money to be taken away from the police and instead put towards programs that prevent the violence in the first place. Because something that has happened is both um, mm -hmm. an increase, so there's a unique situation with police in black communities to where they are, Ever, they are always present to question, to harass, to write, um, to pe penalize people for very minor um, infractions or even made up um, infractions. But they are rarely able, they're rarely present when people actually need help or when there's actually something violent happening. So, murders are, are almost never solved and they happen in communities. When people call because there's some kind of violent event happening, it often takes a remarkably long time for the police to arrive. So what they're calling for is, is for those funds that are being put into a, a system that may be less efficient at, at actually even dealing with crime, like the, the thing that it is supposed to be dealing with in the first place and moving funds towards prevention. So in a lot of these communities, unemployment for, I think in Chicago, unemployment for black men over the age of 16 is like, I think almost 60%, it's like 55 or more percent. So it is a remarkable amount of unemployment of schools that are being de defunded. So schools are being shut down, no money being spent towards health. And so all of these factors lead to unrest even within the community. And when violence is being perpetrated by the police, often that can spread to other factors of the community. So there, there is a problem of um, interpersonal violence in some of these communities, but the solution that many are saying is not more police. The solution is to address the social problems that are leading to these economic and interpersonal issues in the first place. But um, a lot, but I will say that a lot of the one of the reasons why for all the other crimes though, so that's murder, but for all of the other crimes, one of the reasons why the rate is so high is because the police are there. So if the police are there, so it's not so much that the rate, the rate is high 
because black people commit crimes more is that our police are always around while those things are being committed. So white Americans also use drugs. They also might, you know, get in fights, but the police are not called or police are not there to arrest them for it, or they're less, they're just absent from those communities in a way that they're very, very always present in black communities. So that is partly why you see these differences in rates. Oh, I can't hear you. I think you're muted. You're muted, Monka. Uh, okay. Thank you, Shay. I will come back to you with a couple of other questions after going to uh, Carl. Uh, Carl, uh, welcome, and uh, I really appreciate your time, your participation. Uh, you are a colleague and a friend. We have done uh, several research together. Hopefully, we can also accomplish the book together as well. Carl, uh, 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 أقدم ال professor كارل professor كارل ال professor كارل هو أستاذ ال أو رئيس قسم ال ال الدراسات الأمنية في جامعة في جامعة أكرون هذا الدكتوراه في العلوم السياسية مختار في الدراسات وأيضا في دراسات السياسي وهو أيضا عنده اطلاع جيد عن العراق يعني عمل بحث بخاصة فيما يتعلق بالعاش اليوم راح نركز على موضوع الأمن. اسمحوا لي راح أتحول للغة الإنجليزية. Uh, I know that you are one of those fans of surveys and public opinion, and you like reading numbers. So. What the numbers are telling you about the incident of killing Floyd? And okay, for, where, where do you where do you think this will lead? I mean, if in a societal uh, from a society uh, soci uh, socio political point of view. Okay, so first of all, thanks for having me, Munkith. I really appreciate it. Um, I found Shay's comments extremely interesting and I learned a lot. So I'm very happy to be part of this, this uh, webinar. So in terms of public opinion in the US, we've had a couple of major surveys that have been done in the last couple of weeks. Uh, one was done by the Associated Press and one was do, done by the uh, Pew Research Center. And these surveys are really, I think, very telling about how Americans view what's going on with the protests. And one of the major takeaways I get from this is that Americans are increasingly concerned about police violence. So for example, with the American uh, Associated Press survey that was done, a big national survey, uh, it was shown that there's a significant increase among black Americans and white Americans with police violence. So from, there was a survey done that asked the same questions in 2015, and then these same questions were asked again in 2020, just recently, a couple weeks ago. And what we find, I'm gonna read you a few numbers here. Um, in 2015, 70% of black respondents said that police violence against the public was a major problem. In 2020, just recently, that, that number has risen to 80%. So 80% of African-American respondents believe that, that violence by the police against the public is a serious problem. 
But I think what's more telling about this data and could be more politically potent in some ways in terms of having an effect on how things move in the United States is that in 2015, 20% of whites said that violence against the public by police was a serious problem. But now in 2020, 40% say that this is a major problem. So a doubling of the respondents uh, within the white cohort who are saying that this is a significant problem. So that's, that I think is, is a very important takeaway. So um, there's a couple other things I see in the data that I wanted to, to highlight that I think are important for people who are participating in this webinar to, to know. Um, one of the things that's, that's really, really interesting uh, that's come from a recent survey by Pew Research Center is how Black Americans and white Americans report their interactions with police. So what this data has shown is that 10% um, of white respondents, and this was a very large survey, almost 9,000 respondents, very large national survey, 10% of whites had reported that they had been unfairly stopped by the police. 50% of African Americans surveyed said they had been unfairly stopped by the police. That's both female and male. When you just take the male cohort out of that, it goes up to 65%. So 65% of African American males reported that they've been unfairly stopped by the police. Wow. And that goes to what Shay was saying about the presence of the police in the neighborhood. And that, you know, there's a suspicion that something's going on frequently by the police. And we've seen research, you know, that's gotten into police bias and how police look at, at um, African American males and how they look at, at white American males. And there's very frequently a bias that they assume that the African American males are up to no good. And so, you know, the same survey showed that 80% of black respondents felt like they are frequently looked at with suspicion. So that, that's very important. That, that means that there's, there's a lot of African Americans who feel like they have to really prove that they're not doing anything wrong rather than, you know, well, I'm not doing anything wrong. I don't have to worry about being viewed with suspicion. They have to prove that they're not doing anything wrong. So another thing I wanted to point to, and I don't want to overwhelm you with numbers, but uh, no, no, I think it's really important to look at the divide in how Americans view the protests. So there, there's a very stark division between Republicans and Democrats in terms of how they view the protests. And some of this probably comes from innate biases that they have, you know, socialization over the years. But some of this comes from like what you were talking about a minute ago, Monketh, and that is the type of television that you watch and the social media that you have coming into your phone or into your computer, that is extremely important in how you view these protests. So that, that, that information environment is really important. So here, here's some numbers uh, about how um, Republicans and Democrats think about the protests. This is from Pew, Pew Research Center. 60% uh, of Republicans think that the protests are driven by anger over the death of George Floyd. 80% of Democrats think that. So that, that's not too startling of a difference. But only 45% of Republicans believe that the protests have anything to do with longstanding issues that African Americans have with their position in America. Compare that to 85% of Democrats who believe that these protests are about long-standing issues. And I think one of the most important takeaways from this is when you look at how Republicans and Democrats think about criminality in the protests. So, you know, are there criminals that are driving the protests, or is these, you know, is this people who have um, grievances that, that are legitimate in the way that they're acting um, is legitimized by those grievances. 
So he, here, here I, I'm sorry for interruption because sure. I want to, to ask this question right now. When okay. you read numbers about, uh, when you just present the numbers, the differences between Democrats and Republicans, it came to my mind because we have similar things here in, in Iraq, but in a different way. Do you think that racism has been politicized or policy has been racist? Which uh, I think the short answer to both of those questions is yes. Yeah. Um, sure. yeah. Uh, I think definitely race is being politicized. I think it's, it, it has been for a long time uh, in the United States. I think sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's overt. Um, I've lived in different parts of the country. I, you know, I'm, I'm originally from, from Chicago, uh, but I've lived in the Deep South. And I can tell you in the Deep South, it, it's a lot more open, the, the way that, that race gets talked about, than it may be up North, but it's still there um, in all parts of the countries, how racial identities and, and, and interests play a part in politics. But I think Trump is different in that Trump uh, took a lot of what I think um, Republicans were thinking about race and made it, and not just Republicans, but, but a lot of people in the United States, things that they said probably privately, he says publicly. And so for, you know, when a lot of people were talking about what's the appeal of Trump, and then you go to his supporters, they'll say, he says what we think. He's like us. And so he has made this overt. He's made it a part of the narrative and he's legitimizing a lot of this. You know, Carl, this is the usual, typical narrative for every populist supporters. They always claim everywhere, even in Iraq, here, when we uh, talk about some leaders who use populism to serve their goals when I ask people about uh, how can he just mention this publicly they say that we, we all believe in that but he is saying it publicly while many others cannot say and they regard this as some some bravious thing yeah. Yeah, it's, it shows courage on his part to say these things. And, you know, the typical thing that, that you hear about this is that people have been too politically correct to deal with these issues in the past. And so you break down political correct language and simply say, look, this is the reality of it. But what we're incre increasingly seeing, and I'm wondering if this is part of the response that you're seeing to some of the protests, very heavy-handed response from police, and also these vigilantes who come out into the protests, you know, armed like they're going to battle with body armor on and, and uh, assault weapons and stuff like that. If part of this is not a response to, we're finally fighting back, you know, that, that Trump has, has normalized some of these attitudes that used to be fringe, and now they're made more, they're made more legitimate, and so you're seeing, you know, potentially a more heavy-handed response or, or more overt um, racist response than you would see otherwise. Okay. So, yeah, just go ahead. I Sorry, I interrupted you about the numbers. Do you, have, do you still have more numbers about... Well, I, the, the one thing that I find um, extremely interesting in the numbers, um, is, is about criminality and that 80% um, of Republicans look at the crimes as being driven by criminals and 40% of Democrats believe that they're, they're criminals who are using the demonstrations. So if you look at, for example, you were talking about Fox News, if you go to Fox News during prime time, so in the evening, so from eight till what, 11 o'clock, I guess, um, they have three people who have hour long shows. And I've been watching this recently to see how they're covering the protests, how they're discussing the protests. 
And the, the theme is criminality, criminality, criminality. And that these these protests You mean the black um, criminality. Black, black criminality it's two two elements. Yeah. Black criminality and violent leftist terrorists. Okay. They're the two two kind of elements that are driving this. And so that they these these protests need to be put down is the argument of these these people who are you know the so-called talking heads uh, during this time slot, and um, so you know it depends on who you ask in the United States. What, what's going on with the protests? Who's leading the protests? You get very different responses based on where they get their information and what their partisan identity is, uh, and and more and more in America, those two things completely overlap. Um, you know. Democrats get their information from one source, Republicans get their information from another source. The days in the United States where everybody watched ABC, CBS, NBC news to get their information where it was a shared information source, those are long gone. Okay. I just want to now go to another topic, related topic, which is violence. <laughs> One of the things we noticed in these uh, protests, uh, the acceleration of the level of violence, whether from this uh, uh, party or that, especially those uh, uh, white groups uh, what they call it, the, they have this, uh, the name, the, the fasc anti-fascist, anti, -fascist, anti uh, um, Antifa. Yeah. Antifa, yeah, the Antifa. So, and as someone who is expert in violence, in political violence, uh, what do you think about that? Is it uh, now a, un a unique, uh, incidents for this uh, protest or for these protests, or there was always, there had been always this kind of violence in previous protests as well? It's, a, it's an excellent question. Uh, I think there there's frequently been violence in large scale protests in the past, it's just a question of violence. I mean, sometimes the protests are perfectly peaceful, but it's not been uncommon for there to be protests in the United States to become violent and for a whole different range of issues and protests about different things. So um, that's not something that's terribly new. Antifa is a relatively recent thing in the United States. Um, it's only been around really since the, the 2000s. Uh, as a movement, but Antifa has predecessors that have been around. They've been smaller, kind of less energized. Uh, once again, social media and, and that kind of thing has, has helped drive the growth of this. Um, Antifa is actually a movement that, that got started in Europe and has been um, kind of adapted into the United States a little bit. One of the things I would say about Antifa, Antifa has become a completely politicized issue in the United States. Um, if you watch Fox News, Antifa is a left-wing terrorist threat to the United States. If you go to um, CNN, Antifa is portrayed um, as basically uh, extreme left protesters or counter-protesters more accurately who come to these protests, particularly by white supremacists or other very right um, groups, and they're looking to, to stop their protest. So sometimes they engage in fist fights, sometimes they throw things, but they don't go to the protests armed with, with firearms trying to kill people. So they don't fit the, the definition the US government has, for example, of terrorists. There's another much more dangerous group of people who've been showing up to the protests called Boogaloo Boys. 
And Boogaloo Boys, it's another movement. So Antifa is not an organization, neither is the Boogaloo Boys. These are movements, kind of ideological movements. Boogaloo Boys are very ardent supporters of the Second Amendment of the US Constitution. So what that means is they're very pro-gun rights. They're very paranoid about the US government coming to take their guns away. And they're, they're so anti-government that they actually want there to be a, a civil war in the United States that causes the US government to fall. So Boogaloo is in reference to the civil war that they want. They call it the Great Boogaloo. These guys show up to protests armed. They're the ones often that wear body armor, assault rifles, trying to intimidate protesters. Or sometimes they use the protests as cover to attack the police. And we've had actual terrorist attacks that have happened by Boogaloo Boys against police where they, they have specific targeted police that they want to kill. Okay. So, some of them do fit the definition of terrorism. Thank you, Carl. Uh, sure. uh, I share. Is there any question came to your mind while Carl was talking or presenting, and yeah. you want to ask Carl about him about oh, this? To ask Carl about. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Not me. To ask Carl. I guess I'll, I, I don't know if there's something I want to ask per se, but I do want to, to add to his comments about sure. Antifa. Um, so Antifa, I think that there's a really big misperception in part because of the Trump administration and they're kind of designating Antifa as an organization. Um, again, it's, yeah, it's not an organization. It is a set of, it's a, a movement. It's a set of, I, ideas about wanting to resist fascism wherever and whenever it arises or, or and including the groups um like various white supremacist groups that they argue are wanting to bring back fascism i will say that the majority of those who are part of different anti-fascist groups or ideologies the majority of them are peaceful they do protest peacefully something that they think the reason that some people feel that they are violent is because they do not actively condemn violence. Um, they are, it's, well, violence, and I want to clarify here, um, it's because the protesters themselves and many organizers also clarify this, about violence as in violence against people and then property damage. So their argument is that property damage can be destructive, but for them, that's not violence because people are not physically being harmed. So their argument is that the government and these other, and many of these uh, white supremacist extremist groups are committing actual violence, but they're committing property damage. And so I think that is, that is a distinction that I think is worth making. So when we talk about, you know, maybe the types of violence that you might see in Iraq versus what we're seeing in the United States. This is, you know, a store or like that had windows broken or trash cans that were set on fire. The violence that we're seeing is not, is, so some are arguing that that's not even violence, that that is property damage. And I do want to say though, that I think there is a, an, a drive on both the left and the right to, to put all of that property damage on these various organizations. So either Antifa or right-wing extremists coming in, which we see both. But a lot of this was ordinary people, ordinary people who were upset, who were grieving, who were outraged by what they were seeing and wanted to express that through breaking windows. Mm -hmm. And I think that, in, once those windows are broken, it's also very easy to go in and grab things out of the store. Um, but I think to keep in mind that a lot of these communities have been ravaged by the pandemic economically, like the black community has been truly devastated. And so there has been some discussion among many people, of like, can we even really condemn folks who, 
are wanting to grab, you know, blankets from the store. Um, and there, you know, there's, there's been some discussion about that, but I just wanted to make the, def the distinction yeah. between violence against people and then property damage. Here, I, I just want to uh, uh, inform you about uh, one of the most circulated posts in mm -hmm. social media in Iraq when they compare protests in Iraq with protests in United States. Mm. They say that, or that, that uh, or these posts in social media always referring to the fact that in Iraq, for six months, we had very violent uh, protest, mm -hmm. yet not one single shop has been broken, no looting, nothing happened at the private property. Mm -hmm. All damages happened to public, to the governmental buildings. While in the United States, we saw the opposite. Mm -hmm. Most damages took place in private properties. Though we know that private property in the United States is something sacred uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the capital, uh, in the uh, US system. So, do, do you have any idea or do you have any uh, uh, idea why? this happened in the United States, why people attacked or broke private properties? So I think there are a couple of different reasons. So one is, honestly, I think the tactics that the police use sometimes, where they tear gas people, or they, honestly, I've seen it before, where they push them towards these buildings and disperse people. And when people are dispersed from the moderating influence of the crowd, they may be more tempted to break a window in frustration. What I've also seen is that sometimes, you know, people are the tear gas in their eyes, they're trying to find a way to escape it or to clean it. And I've seen cases where they've then decided to break windows of you know, drug stores or pharmacies in order to get at supplies. And then that can lead to everything then being like it kind of cascades and everything, everything is taken. So that's one thing I have directly seen in some of these protests is where the police are the first to engage in violence and that then spreads to the prop that disperses people to engage in property damage, partly for their own, you know, trying to get supplies for themselves or just trying to escape um, the police. There is, though, I, and I think that, again, there are a lot of different factions of people coming out into these protests. Um, there are some that simply want to, are like, hey, I might as well get something out of this. You know, I'm struggling in my difficult times and like, let me go, go grab some kind of electronic from the store. That might, that does exist, although I think that's the minority. But in some cases, there is a there is a strong movement right now, like a sub movement, that's very anti capitalist, um, and so I, so in some ways, a lot of these targets are you know, bigger stores that are kind of seen as symbols of this the problems of capitalism, and yeah, there's so there's a little bit of everything happening all at once, and so but the more I think people at Again, this has really died down, but at the very beginnings of the protest, I think there was a sense of some people, some of it, it started off with legitimate anger and expressing that anger. And then some came in to kind of maybe take advantage or participate, but also kind of see if they can get something out of it or just for the, something that's, I think, unique maybe in the United States is, and that hasn't really come up is that Breaking things is a very American way of expressing okay. anger. People will pay in a lot of cities. They will pay to go into a room to break pottery, to break glass, to break things. Like that is actually something that very, that wealthy people will go pay to do. So in these situations, people didn't have to pay. They could join the protest and release that anger about all of the things that they were feel, feeling about the killing and maybe even about things in their own lives. And then there's the 
kind of the anti-capitalist small piece of it as well. All right. Uh, uh, Carl, uh, the same question you can answer it, but there is a couple or there are a couple of questions from audience here about the uh, the, raci uh, the racism in the United States and human rights. And the, these questions are asking, uh, how can United States claim that it stands for human rights in the world? You know, the international policy of United States, this narrative always have been in the uh, uh, foreign policy. Uh, principles of United States standing for human rights while people are seeing how these human rights being violated in United States by whether by this incident or other similar things so what do you think it's a great question you know, and it's certainly something that I know our diplomats are struggling with. And some of our diplomats are actually resigning now because they say it's untenable. How can I represent the foreign policy of the United States when this is going on? Uh, I just don't feel like it's the right thing to do. The United States is, is I think, a country that has um, had very lofty principles that you know, kids are taught about in civics class as they grow up, uh, and and we've we've paid a lot of lip service to those things for a very long time since the creation of the country, but they get interpreted different ways by different segments of the population, and I think also that um, there's not complete agreement in the United States on. What human rights mean? Who who these are? Who these are meant to protect these rights? Um, and so, you know, they make sense and they are attractive in the abstract. But I think when they get applied in the country, it gets very difficult for people to come to a consensus. Uh, and one of the major factors about this, and you know, from from our discussions about this, you know, a lot of times people look at this as, well. What what is the what is the um, economic angle here? So what what are the economic drivers of the protests? What are what are the protests? You know what's driving them about how people feel secure or not? I think a huge thing that's going on right now is a struggle between uh, particularly lower income whites and they're feeling like Trump finally is increasing their their stature and their significance and their sense of I'm finally somebody and they feel threatened when African Americans look like they're trying to increase their stature and their sense of respect in the United States and I, I, I see this as a it's not just recently this has been going on for a long time but I think I see this as a big source of the backlash that got Trump into office. I unfortunately think there's probably going to be another backlash that's going to come from this. There's good things that are going to come from this, obviously, but there's also going to be a backlash. And it's going to be another um, problem for the United States in terms of its image. But um, I, I look at Trump's not even really trying to fight for human rights globally anymore. He's kind of just dropped that from the narrative of the U.S. foreign policy. Yeah, unfortunately. Unfortunately, yeah. because, you know, human rights was one of the pillars of the soft power of United States soft power. And I can see the erosion uh, in, in, in that soft power in that regard. Uh, I will go to Shay. Uh, there is a question from the audience saying that do you think that what is happening right now in the United States is or because of personal behavior, organizational errors in the security service system, or maybe uh, it's a hatred uh, uh, 
speech uh, which is prevailing right now there or polarization what do you think what is the real reason behind this as a sociologist how do you see this is it personal organizational group behavior uh, uh, political behavior how do you regard this so you're asking from the standpoint of the police like why, why no, what is leading the police no. or from from, from the point of view uh, of a sociologist evaluating the situation. If you now go to the United States government or administration and you have been asked for your advice, what you would say the, the main reason is that just a personal behavior, isolated personal behavior by police, mm -hmm. or it is a systematic uh, uh, behavior by the organization of police or it is part of the uh, inter, uh, internal politics and polarization in United States? I think it's more the organizational aspect at the institutional level. Um, there are individual bad actors. There are individual racist cops. Um, well, one of the indications of how problematic the institution is, is that it is almost, in many cases, almost impossible to remove those bad actors. There has been um, just yeah, using this, these bad actors as like a, a way of illustrating how terrible, like how problematic the system is. I've talked to police chiefs who have told me, you know, I would like to fire these officers who continually harass um, harass civilians, beat them up, sexually assault women who they've come in contact with. But if they fire them, the unions, the police unions have so much power and they have set up so many laws to where um, those officers are, will almost always get their jobs back. And in a way it costs so the, the, the city, even more money to try to fire them because they will try to fire them and then they have to hire lawyers. There's this arbitration back and forth between trying to keep the, the, this corrupt police officer on the force and the city trying to fire them. And, and, mo and a lot of the time they lose. So it's cheaper for them to just ignore the problem and, and you know, keep those bad actors on. And that's, and that's really the tip of the iceberg um, in terms of the organizational problems. I think that in some ways, this is a situation where an institution has been left to govern itself and determine its own trajectory. Um, police in the United States are very insulated from any kind of democratic control. Um, there's very little that civilians can do to try to influence how um, police are governed or organized or run because they, there are very few channels, maybe in some cases through the mayor, but even that it really only affects the police chief. And again, we talked about the limits of that chief. They can't even fire some of the officers that they think are bad. Um, cities have city councils where they can kind of, they can, they have control over the budgets, but it's almost, it's very rare that those budgets are ever touched. Um, and they're almost always ever added to. So currently there, there's been a lot of scrutiny of different um, budgets of police forces around the country and they can range from 25% of the entire budget for the city to upwards of like 40%. So really massive amounts of funds that are being de devoted to these departments and with no oversight. So they, so in some ways they have, they, a lot of these are individuals who either come from the military or wish they could have been in the military. And they oftentimes want to fight. They want to be a good guy versus a bad guy. And so you have to keep, there has to continue to be a bad guy for you to have that fight. And so whether that bad guy is created or invented or, you know, they do exist for, certainly, but it is rare. Uh, it is so rare that officers even make those kind of arrests for felonies or serious crimes. So they kind of have to create 
you know, create action for themselves, create something to do so they, so they can ask for more money and have more things to do in a sense. Um, so in a way, this problem, and I think that the reason that we've kind of relinquished democratic control of the police is in part because of the, what you're talking about with the polarization, but also because of the racist beliefs and rhetorics of the need, the idea that we need to be protected from black criminals. Um, which is in part why there's been, why there was willingness for decades to give more money to the police and let them have autonomy in how they controlled crime. Um, but I think, I think in some ways it's, yeah, it's the problem with the institution and the culture within it well, that is. So another question here, which is also related. Do you think that uh, there should be a legislation new legislation or legislative reform or institutional reform which what is the priority right now for legislations or for institutions to be reformed well i don't think the institutions will be reformed without any legislation uh, they have to have some external force to reform the institution otherwise they will not um, even in we've seen in cases where there have been institutional reforms in various states and various cities that have tried to introduce new training, have tried to, again, make, try to make it easier to fire officers. And those reforms have not stopped the problem because the institutions themselves find new ways. So right now there, I don't know if you've heard, but there's a very, there's a growing movement among these protesters for calls to either defund the police or abolish them entirely and replace them with a different sort of public safety system. So, and, and, and these reforms in the legislations should be done on the federal level or the local level? This is where I honestly am not sure. Um, because policing is done at the local level, to make meaningful change, it almost has to be there. But at the same time, there are, again, over 18,000 law enforcement agencies. So you'd have to do this almost eight, at least 18,000 times. And there's not even an entire, we don't even have a full count of like every single agency in the United States, which is kind of remarkable. Um, so in some ways, for there to be any sort of meaningful change, it would seem to, to require federal legislation. But again, I think that's so unlikely to happen in this administration um, that, yeah, you're kind of left with, neither option is really ideal. Okay. So I have almost around five to 10 minutes. I want to ask uh, Carl right now about what do you think the consequences of these protests on Trump chances for a new presidency? And how do you see the polarization? I mean, what is the, also the, the effect of these protests on the polarization in the political uh, atmosphere which is all already there do you think that what is going on will call for some kind of reforms in the political system which can bridge or overcome or at least narrow down this gap between leftists rightists or you see it as this will going deeper or this will make it even worse i mean polarization so two questions presidency and polarization so both great questions uh and the the first one about the presidency if we if we look at the data now uh his response to the protests have hurt him politically uh and particularly with people who live in the suburbs with women, with more educated Republicans. Uh, so people who, who've been maybe what we could say the, the not completely solid supporters of Trump, uh, 
have found his response, particularly what he did when he created the photo op where he um, marched with some of the army or the military uh, brass across the street having protesters tear gassed and, and thrown out of the way and then holding up the Bible in what I think a lot of people consider kind of a, a silly photo op. And then just his general rhetoric around the protest um, they've heard him. So we can see in polls now that, that he's been heard. So if, if that trend continues, I think he's in serious trouble. I know a lot of Republicans are saying that they're very concerned that not only will he lose, but that uh, other Republicans down ticket will be hurt by him and his response to these protests. So, um, I don't, I don't see Trump magically changing his tune and becoming more inclusive. I think he's going to continue to um, be divisive because I think he thinks that's what one of the presidents need. That, that kind of um, divisiveness and the um, xenophobia and the, and the race baiting, I think he looked at as, as successful political strategies. Okay. In terms of polarization, I think this polarizes the United States more in some ways. In some ways, I think it may actually help a little bit to reduce polarization. But I, I think overall, um, I'm, 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 I'm maybe somewhat negative about this, that this will continue to polarize or deepen the polarization that, that exists in the United States. All you have to do is spend an evening and watch the coverage on Fox and watch the coverage on CNN or MSNBC. And you see that there are two Americas who live in completely different information spaces and they have completely different realities. And that is not room for hope right now. It may be a case in the United States where things have to get truly, truly terrible before people realize that this kind of polarization is, is undoing the country. You know my background, I'm, I'm first generation German American, so my, my family live the consequences of deep polarization and extremism that came from that. And you know, for a lot of Germans, they think it took, it took horrible consequences for Germans to figure out that they're better united than divided. Okay, so uh, there is a, a question just came now for you, uh, Carl. Um, and it says that if we go right now to the, to the most racist city in the United States. Uh, what is the percentage that Carl uh, expect for those who think that Floyd deserved the, uh, the death or people had not, uh, uh, or sorry, the, the police was not doing wrong they that was just a personal thing incident happened by by accidents not intentionally that's a difficult question to answer because you know i don't know what the most racist city in america is um and there are americans who do think that the police the police did nothing wrong there are people out there who think that that the cop who kneeled on on his neck wasn't doing anything wrong that he was he was a you know there's all kinds of excuses for it he was a criminal he was doing things that got him into trouble and so the cop was just doing his job i from the opinion polling that we see and you know you have to take that with somewhat of a grain of salt because people don't always answer questions about race truthfully obviously um but the opinion polling shows that most americans including um, people who you think be more sympathetic to the police are pretty upset about what happened. So that I, th I find encouraging. That even even people who you who are Trump supporters would say that that was not the right thing to do. That that guy was killed. Um, it, 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 you know that was not a legal killing. This was this was something very wrong. All right. I think. Uh... Uh, I have covered everything. The the time is uh, there is done right now. Uh, just I will ask Shay if if she has any comments 
on anything uh, being said here. Yeah, I do want to express that I think like the last question about how many people think that, you know, George Floyd was killed in a way that was appropriate or was this a very egregious situation or problematic situation. I do th I do think because I've looked at so many of these cases and I've seen the response to so many of these cases that this is a new, this is a little bit different than those in the past, which I think is in part what's fueling the bigger protest because there are much, much fewer people now saying, oh, George Floyd deserved to die. There, there still are, but it is, I think, much fewer than in the past. I think that there's something about the fact that, you know, he was you know, suffocated to death rather than shot by police. I think if he had been shot, there would have been an argument that perhaps the police feared for their life or there would have been some deference to the police of we'll trust that they must have made the right decision. But I think because it was a lengthy video where you were able to literally watch him die, there was much, much less um, support or willingness to um, kind of give the police the benefit of the doubt in this situation. And I think that has really opened up a lot of people's eyes, I think, to the reality of what is happening on, even when the cameras aren't rolling, because these, these incidents happen all, very frequently in situations where there was no camera um, to take the video. And do you think that police had, or have learned the, the, the lesson? I don't. Um, I don't. <laughs> I think maybe, maybe in Minneapolis, yeah, maybe in the city of Minneapolis, maybe. Although Minneapolis, this is already their third or fourth major na national head police killing that made national headlines that resulted in huge protests. They've they've been through this three or four times in just the last five or six years. Um, so I, I I don't think that. Um, yeah, I'm not, I don't, I think it's going to, I think that the protests will have to continue a lot longer for them to learn. So you, you think that protests will continue for a long time or not? Um, I think that, I'm not sure how long this particular wave will last, um, but there will always be more deaths. There will, police are, conti are continuing to kill more people, so there will be more sparks to keep the fire going. Um, so for that reason, I, this, this movement is not going to end, um, but it will take momentary pauses. This is unfortunate. Uh, thank you, Shay, for your time. Uh, really appreciate your participation and your kindness uh, also and your uh, very informative uh, insights. Uh, thank you, Carl. Also, my friend, uh, it was good to have you with me this evening here, evening, not uh, afternoon as in the United States. Uh, hopefully, we have uh, or we will get a chance to, to have more talks and more discussions about new things. And hopefully, racism will be erased eventually from this world thank you thank you thank you thank, thank you, you so much. Bye.